السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Following Brother Bashir and Omar Sulaiman what I wanted first is to actually focus a little bit on what is taking place in Palestine, in Gaza. Uh, part of the work that I do is I'm the chairman of American Muslims for Palestine, and we have been responding to the current developments in Gaza where 17 Palestinians have been uh, assassinated by the Israeli army. Uh, as we see the press today is using the terms clashes, riots, uh, Palestinian violence. What we need is to challenge the media narrative uh, that constantly demonize and victimize the victim once again. And I compare how the framing of the Palestinians today takes place in the same way when a police officer kills an African-American like what happened with Stephon Clark. The press begins to say or use the terms that this must be, quote, because there is a single mother household that the children are or the, the African-Americans are engaging in violence. Or, quote, begin to focus that that person has a record. Or a whole host of trying to frame it black on black violence. That type of terminology we have to understand is an attempt to victimize the victim once again. There is the bullet that hits and kills the person, and that kills the person once. But then there are the bullets that comes out from the writing, that comes out from the TV, that comes out from the radio, that comes out from the conversation, that kills that individual in the consciousness of millions of people. And what we need is to challenge both the bullet that hits the person in the street, as well as those bullets that poison the minds of people and begins to blame the victim for the fact that they have been victimized. That is what is taking place both in here with the African Americans and what is taking place in Palestine. So it's very important that for us as Muslims in this country to be able to rewrite the narrative. We have to be able to rewrite the narrative. Now, part of the work that I do, Palestine, also work on Islamophobia. I run the Islamophobia Studies Center, work with Zaytuna College and others. And what I want you to do is to focus on some of the strategies that we need to undertake in order for us to shift the narrative and to claim our space and our place on the table. Now, I know many of us have bought into this notion that somebody has to invite you to the table. That somebody has to invite you to the table. I will want you to understand that anyone that invites you to the table is actually trying to buy you a free lunch. And there is no such thing in America as a free lunch. There is no such thing in America as a free lunch. You have to arrive to the table on your own terms. You have to make it to the table on your own agenda. You have to make it to the table on your own set of priorities. So one is that you have to actually develop your own agenda and your own vision for what is the future of America is about. We know that we have the Islamophobe in chief in the White House. We have the Islamophobe in chief in the White House and have invited more Islamophobia into the White House and nationally. What is our agenda? We have a president that says he wants to make America great again. And we understand that is a signpost for many around him to make America white again. Nothing against white, whiteness, but in general, what he wants to say that the diversity that changes what is taking place in America is something that has to be brought back to the 1950s. We say America is already great again by all of us being here. America is already great by all of us being here. Martin Luther King made America great again. 
Mal Malcolm X made America great ag again. Rosa Parks made America great again. And we need to understand when we say, when they say, make America great again, it's saying that you don't belong in this country. You belong in this place, and we have to actually say that the future of America belongs to all of us. Think about it. Think about it. Trump came to challenge three things among other elements that he has. One is immigration. One is immigration. Second, trying to roll back some of the civil rights gains that ha have been gained in this country. Third, the Voting Rights Act that has been part of the gains of the civil rights movement. Those three elements is what shifted America from the 1960s till today. So don't think those who are coming out of the woodwork are just coming out just because of yesterday. They've been at it at least for 50 years, trying to reverse the gains of the civil rights movement. In reality, these are the people that have been fighting the civil war because they believe that America still needs to go back to the period pre-civil war. Between, between 1876 and 1950, in 12 southern states, there were 4,000 lynchings. These lynchings were an attempt to try to put African American in the same conditions that they were under slavery. It was a challenge to the empowerment of African American post-Civil War. I argue that the prison industrial complex today is an attempt to disempower African Americans after the Civil Rights Movement. And we see the trajectory. Reagan, when he came into office, he instituted the Prison Reform Act, and we could actually see the figures of imprisonment that increases drastically, and we get the prison industrial complex. African Americans in this country, as well as the Latinos who go to jail, they lose the right to vote. Structural disempowerment, structural disenfranchisement that takes place in this country. So when we say we want to make America great again, we have to understand it is actually what we need is to reverse this trajectory that can structurally disenfranchise people in, in our society. So what is our agenda as Muslims? What is it that we need to do? One, we need to claim this country as our own. We need to claim our, this country as our own. I know some of the immigrants, they come into this country that they're going to go back home. You're not going back anywhere. Get that in your mind. You're not going back anywhere. And where are you going to go? Where are you going? You're going to go to Egypt? You're going to end up in jail because you can't speak. You're going to go to Iraq? It's destroyed. You're going to go to Syria? It's even more destroyed today, and the whole world is fighting there. The Gulf states, they're busy trying to buy some things in here because that's where they want to be. So what is it that you're going to go back to? Your children are already born in here. And they know America much more than they know back home. Again, I'm not telling you not to go and invest and help people back home. You could do that. But the, the moment that you begin to think that this is your country, then you begin to claim it and begin to work for the change that you need to see in this country. Now, being in this country, this is the second part. We need to begin to do serious work to heal and address the rift that exists between the immigrant community and the African-American indigenous community. I know that many of us are superheroes in interfaith dialogue outside, but we need to have an intra-faith dialogue among Muslims ourselves. You cannot go out to fight for a new country if your house is divided. In Arabic, say, When will a building will reach its height if you're building it and someone else is knocking it down? So we need to have an intra-faith or intra-Muslim dialogue, serious dialogue. I am tired of the follow-up dialogue. Like, let's get together during the first or second day of Ramadan. Leaders stand up, they take a picture, and that is the end of the story. 
that has to be set aside. There had to be some serious discussion. Serious discussion between the immigrants, African Americans, Latino, as well as some white converts in relations to what is our agenda in this country. Second, to this intra-faith, intra-Muslim dialogue. We need to have a dialogue between the Sunnis and Shias in this country so we don't export the conflicts in the Muslim world to this, to this country. That is very, very serious. I don't want to hear any nonsense about Sunni-Shia division in, in America. If you come up with a new hadith or a new ayah that could resolve the conflict of historical proportion, please come forth. There is nothing new that you're going to find in order to address theologically that they're right, you're wrong, or opposite. None. There is libraries of shelves and shelves of Muslim polemics on each other for the last 1,300 years. We need to figure out how to do it in this country, right? Because overseas, you know that there is instrumentalization of these divisions. And the, the game is very easy. You stoke sectarian conflicts. You get both or many countries to sell their oil, buy weapons, and do it again. So you eliminate one generation after the other. And in between, you send them delegation to have peace, peace relations between them. You need to smart up and be able to actually create that relationship in here in order not to make it possible for those conflicts to continue. Third, we have to have our agenda for an economic program in this country. And I'm not saying to try to keep up with the Joneses. You cannot keep up with the capitalism as it is. And I know Muslim economics has become Bismillah on top and Alhamdulillah on the bottom and in between it's all capitalism. That has to be transformed. The Prophet Sallallahu came to Mecca and Medina with a different economic vision. We have today in the world, including in this country, we have the haves and the have nothing at all. That's what you have. You have the haves and they have nothing at all. At all. It's not even 1%. It's less than 1% that have the massive resources, completely structurally disproportioned in terms of relations. We have to develop a different economic vision. Sustainability, environmental consciousness, lifting up everyone, transforming our idea of awqaf. This is something that I've been trying to work on. Our awqaf idea today has been reduced to building a mosque, and then, alhamdulillah, this is a waqf. We need to change and rethink of awqaf from the classical period in order for us to generate a new sustainable economic model. Waqf in the history was completely different. If you go to any of the old cities in the Muslim world, there was the mosque in the center. Next to it, there was a school, and then there are different avenues comes out, all the markets, all the different shops and all that were part of a waqf. And those were creating sustainable economic program and economic returns, supporting the school, supporting the uh, mosque, supporting hospital. In the city of Baghdad, there were 18 hospitals. Think about it. There were 18 hospitals, all providing medical care for free. You're talking about the we are in the 21st century, America and here. We're still arguing whether actually to provide health care. Who is civilized and who is still trying to be civilized? 18 hospitals. Where is our Muslim Waqf hospital in this country? Where is our transformation? I know we say, MashaAllah, we have so many Muslim doctors, Alhamdulillah. But what is the contribution? If it's only adding you at the end, your bottom line in the bank, then you have failed. You have failed because medicine is actually helping the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is better than actually to sustain a life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusted us with it as medical establishment. So that's 18 hospitals in the city of Baghdad, in the city of Baghdad alone. Where is the 18 hospitals or 20 hospitals or 30 hospitals in America? And don't tell me that we don't have the resources. That is just like a cop out. We have the resources. If we are able to buy a football team, we're able to build hospitals. We are able to. 
if we're able to spend three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars on a wedding, and you know which communities are, we're able to build hospitals. Right? So there is no excuse for that. So rethinking of awqaf, rethinking of how we develop it, sustainability, and to actually give a different model for our, our economic enterprise in general. Fifth, as Muslims in this country, we have to take seriously the other communities that are part of living in this country collectively with us. I know, mashallah, we say, oh, mashallah, we have so many Muslims in Iqnas Convention. And we do, alhamdulillah, may Allah give them tawfiq. But overall, Muslims are 1.2% of the American society. 1.2%. Meaning, we have to figure out a very coherent way to live with the 98.8% of the American society. We have to figure out how to live with our neighbors, those who have a belief, and those who are increasingly have no belief whatsoever. We have to figure that, that one out. Increasingly, we are just, our response is anyone that is hugging us, we'll hug them back, and we say that's it. There, is in, there isn't any critical engagement to say these are the things we agree with, and these are the things that we have a disagreement, but we still can live together. That is part of what you call being a person that enters into the table on their own accords. We have to figure out within our own collective platform how to achieve this aspect in relations to an agenda that defines who we are while at the same time being able to work with the other. And we have enough in our tradition to point out Muslims for a long period of time they were living as minorities in different settings. They were a ruling minority, which is different because in America we are a minority that is in a weaker position. So we need to learn how to actually engage in a such a way that we don't undermine our principles as we engage in a diverse society. Which gets me into the sixth item which Brother Beth Sheer was talking about, is about our engagement politically. Our engagement politically. We have the upcoming election 2018 and 2020. We have to organize with our coalitions and partners like we haven't done at any time before. Let me tell you the following. We have a president and a political party that have chosen bullying as a strategy for them to stay in power. We have a bully in chief and Islamophobe in chief. Islamophobia, and again, I, I do the studies on Islamophobia. I have the Islamophobia Studies Journal. Islamophobia is driven by electoral strategies. Let me repeat this again. Islamophobia is driven by electoral strategy, not by violence event, by violent events. Election strategy in the UK, it was using Islamophobia to get the Brexit. Islamophobia in the Netherlands election used Islamophobia to get into to get vote in the election. Elections in Austria used Islamophobia to gain votes at the elections. Elections in Germany used Islamophobia with Bagheera to get into votes in the elections. France with Marie Le Pen used Islamophobia to gain votes at the election. Trump and also pre-Trump, the, the Tea Party, used Islamophobia to gain votes at the ballot box, meaning monetizing fear and bigotry to gain votes in the ballot box in American election. That has been part of the history of this country. If you don't believe me, just read the history of electoral strategies in this country. All the way back from the Chinese Exclusionary Act, all the way to Willie Horton campaign ad of the Bush administration, of Bush Sr. Which means the only way that you could treat a bully is by putting them back where they belong, in a cave. That's where the bully belongs. And let me give you this comparison. If your child comes from school 
and says, Mom, Dad, there is a person that is bullying me in school. They took my lunch today. They say, oh, no, no, don't worry, honey. Don't worry, it's okay. He's just being what you call nice. Maybe he's having some issues. Don't worry. The next day, Mom, Dad, the bully took my bag. You bought it for me new at the beginning of the semester. Oh, maybe he needed more than you. Don't worry, we'll buy you another one. That's not the response. When your kid comes and says, there's a bully that is beating me or took my lunch, you get up in your car and you go to school right away. You want to get to see that bully, you want to see the school teacher, you want to see the administrator, and if they don't do anything, you go to the school board of education. That's what we have. We have a bully in the White House. We have bullies in his administration. We have an Islamophobes that decide that the way for them to gain power and get elected is by demonizing you and bullying you on a daily basis. The only way for us to challenge him is to come out in large numbers, to challenge him at every corner, to make their life very difficult, that there is no way for a bully to still stand and win elections in this country. They want to monetize Islamophobia, racism, bigotry, and fear to win seats of power. That is the whole old game in this electoral process in this country. And we need to know it, and we need to understand it, and we need to defeat it. And the only way to defeat it is by organizing election-wise, getting everybody registered, getting everybody in your household registered, getting your uncle, your aunt, Make sure that you also get absentee ballot for those who can't go to the, to, the, to the precincts. You have to do your job in order for us to actually put the bully back in, where they belong, back in the cave, so they would never come back again. We're not the people of the cave. They're the ones who actually come out of the cave, and that's the racism that we have pushed to push back. All right? This is... Jazakumullah khair. This is the type of work that needs to be done. And I don't want to hear the argument of, well, is it halal to vote or not haram to vote? If the Prophet Yusuf was in Egypt undertaking saving the country while Pharaoh was the leader, you are the same way as the Prophet Yusuf in today's America attempted to save the country from the likes of Trump and all his cronies that are in the White House. So be the Yusufs of today and let's bring change and let's make America great by us being in it and making it great because it belongs to all the people that want to build this country and make it better. Our tradition in Islam is wherever we go, we want to make the place better because we are people that uplift civilization. So let's get to work. Let's change this country. Let's make it better for everyone that is in this country. And let's demolish the walls. Let's end Islamophobia. And let's make everyone in this country able to live their life to the best and to the brightest that God has placed them in this country. And lastly, let's open the jail cells and open the doors of the jails and let's get our brothers and sisters that are there because they've been put out into prisons in order to disenfranchise them, African Americans and Latinos. That is something that is our task. Just like Yusuf went out of jail, we need to get the Yusufs out of jail of America today. Malcolm X is present today. He's in jail. If we don't get him out, you will not have the future, the possibilities of those that like Malcolm X. So remember, that's our task and that's our role. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.